Consumers should be very concerned because we just do not know what's going to happen in the long term of eating these genetically modified foods. GMOs, what's that? I wouldn't know what they are. What is that? I don't even know what it is. We get a tremendous amount of uh, questions from our customers about GMOs. We now have the worst epidemic of weight gain, obesity, and diabetes, and other health conditions that the world has ever witnessed. The food on the grocery store shelves are not the same products that our parents ate. Are there potential health risks with these new creations of science? Uh, we're doing a, a documentary on food. Okay. What people eat. Uh, I'm wondering if you eat GMOs. I found that almost everyone I talked to had no clue what they were. What is that? I don't even know what it is. GMO? What's that? By and large, there was widespread ignorance of the issue. For a lot of people, GMOs just feel like the latest acronym that they don't know what it is, but they know it's getting some attention. And a GMO stands for genetically modified organism. Almost all Americans have eaten genetically modified foods. In fact, it, there's over 40,000 different things in the grocery store, and over 80% of all the foods that are packaged contain genetically modified organisms. 86% of corn is genetically modified, 93% of soy, 93% of cotton, 80% of Hawaiian papaya, 95% of sugar beets. These are all genetically modified organisms that most people may not know are in their grocery stores. GMOs are organisms that are fundamentally different in that their DNA has been changed. Importantly, these are completely new organisms. So it's the DNA of bacteria, virus, another plant, another animal. It's actually inserted into the DNA of the crop that you're trying to genetically modify, creating this brand new concept that never could have happened in nature. So example, they didn't take two different species of corn and put them together. They took corn, which was a food before, and they made it into an actual pesticide. Now the corn doesn't need to be sprayed with pesticide. It releases pesticides as it grows. So this is, this is very different. You can see how you could never have created this just through breeding. So when you hear that farmers have been genetically modifying since the dawn of time, absolutely not. I just had a gut reaction to chemical companies feeding me and my children, because my idea was that farmers were feeding us. I hadn't realized that behind most of the food are very big agrochemical companies. And then common sense told me, okay, if this pesticide producing GMO kills insects, certainly it might have some effect on us too. Consumers should be very concerned because we just do not know what's going to happen in the long term of eating these genetically modified foods. This is a relatively new phenomenon. Basically they came about in the mid 1990s, so it's been less than 20 years that they've been in the marketplace. The only people who do tests on genetically modified foods are the companies that want to be selling us genetically modified foods. So we are the largest guinea pig trial for genetically modified foods that has ever existed. I approached the big companies over and over again with phone calls asking them to, to talk to me, uh, on or off camera, really. And one of my basic questions was, I can't escape your product. It's, it's everywhere. It permeates everything, and so my children are essentially eating your product, and I want you to show me and how it's safe. The reaction from the big chemical companies and the corporations was such a contrast from the reaction that I received going to organic farms. They walk me all around, show me everything, you know, the kids could play, and the, the companies, it was, you need to leave right now. There's something not right here. Something's going on. They're not being completely transparent. I'm very straightforward. You know, I'm not going to lie to someone and say definitively GMOs are awful for you and I can tell you that because of X, Y, and Z. The reason I can't tell you that X, Y, and Z is because GMOs are owned and created by a couple of agricultural companies and they own a patent. By the way that our legal system works and our scientific system works then, in, if we wanted to do any studies on those seeds, we would have to have the right of those particular companies. And you can imagine that they're not out there doing third-party research and letting anyone do research on their products. 
they've done a very controlled amount of research in a finite amount of time. So we have you know, research on rats that show a month or two where, hey, everything's fine. The rest of the world has looked at science studies where they've looked at what happens at three months, it's horrific. At five months, it's horrific. By horrific, I mean at the three month marker, we're seeing in rats and certainly years out even worse, we're seeing the types of diseases and problems that I see people walking into my office with every day. We're seeing the autoimmunes, the cancers, the tumors, the infertility, all of these things happening at exponential levels in rats. You know, in rats that or in mice that naturally get you know four or five tumors they're getting 400 or 500 tumors they're dying sooner they're not able to reproduce you have to question what the industry tells you about their own products we should know this from the lead industry from the tobacco industry they're trying to sell a product and they're trying to sell a product not only to the American people but to the farmers growing the food Companies that create GMOs don't want their foods labeled. It's like a skull and crossbones on the package if it says GMO. Actually, America is falling far behind the other countries in this fight against GMOs. Numerous other countries ban them or have very severe restrictions against them. And so Europe, and now along with 64 other countries around the world, including China, Russia, and Syria, have labeling and yet, where it's all started here in the United States, we don't have labeling. I think labeling is such a basic right uh, for consumers to be informed so they can make their own choice. And if you have consumers who believe in genetic modification and they wanna choose that, then they can grab that food. And if you have people who want to avoid it and choose something different, they can select something else. I think we have a long way to go to educate the public. I mean, America takes a very different view than Europe and the other countries. In America, it's we'll put GMOs into the food until they're proven unsafe. Over in those other countries that have banned GMOs, they say we're going to keep them out of the foods until they've been proven safe. And I think we really need to start looking at the safety of the American public in the way the Europeans do. I also feel very hopeful because I've seen so many people who are waking up and Really, it's taking back our food and, and taking ownership over it and realizing that this is the most intimate interaction we have with the planet around us. Until laws are changed and labeling is adopted by manufacturers, you can empower yourself by learning to look for hidden ingredients. Whole Foods Market is requiring by 2018 that all products uh, containing GMOs be, be labeled accordingly. We are the first national uh, grocery retailer to, uh, to announce a deadline for GMO transparency. We get a tremendous amount of questions from our customers about GMOs and about GMO labeling. You know, and, and the main one is, why have we not done this yet? It's for all of our products in our store. So, you know, we work with over 100,000 suppliers, so it's a very big and complicated process. It's not just the actual genetically modified organisms that we've all heard of that you have to be looking for in the labels. Things like corn and soy. In fact, each of these items has derivatives or other food items that are made out of the corn and soy. For corn, it's things like white vinegar. You don't think about that, but the majority of white vinegar comes from corn. Citric acid is another one, maltodextrin. For soy, soy lecithin, soybean oil, corn starch. It's all these derivatives of the initial GMOs foods that you really have to be concerned about. For example, just here's a brand, random company, and I'm gonna look at the back and I'm gonna read the ingredients because the reading the ingredients is your last bastion of hope for the health conscious consumer. So right here in this bag, you have corn, which is um, actually con considered a pesticide, not even a vegetable oil anymore, and it's been soaked in another genetically modified oil. So this is definitely not the one that we want to choose. So I'm gonna put that right back. One great way to avoid GMOs is, is to buy organic. Um, USDA organic standards uh, state that GMO seed cannot be used in the production of organic crops. So it's a great way to avoid GMOs. You could buy a perfectly good chip and then you could ruin it with the salsa. <laughs> it has sugar, most likely from a sugar beet, and it has citric acid. Another thing from corn. So these are the derivatives that we're talking about. You want to be very, very careful when purchasing. It's just as easy to buy a good chip. And so here's some great examples. If you look for it, See, non-GMO certified. It's just as simple. You don't have to give up the chips. 
look for the uh, non-GMO project verified seal. Um, we offer more than 3,000 of those items in our stores. Um, each one of our store's web pages offers a non-GMO shopping list, so our customers can go to the web page of their favorite store and, and find a shopping list. Uh, the other thing is our 365 Everyday Value line of products. Uh, all of the ingredients that are derived from plants are sourced to avoid GMOs. A lot of people ask us, what if we don't have an organic choice in our grocery store? And that's okay. What you want to look for then is a product like this. Faye yogurt, for instance, is not USDA organic, but what it does say on the label is we oppose the use of RBGH. This means that they don't use that RBGH synthetic hormone that's been genetically modified. Now, the cattle may still have been fed soy or corn, but at least with this product, you're getting half the benefit. Buying organics doesn't have to be a lot more expensive. Recently, we were shopping in the produce department, and we found that the price of the organic produce was actually exactly the same as the price of the non-organic. So really, it's about checking and reading the labels and also just finding the best deals you can. When purchasing proteins, it's very important to buy organic because most of the animals are being fed genetically modified corn and soy. And we used to think that the feed of the animal wasn't really important. The latest studies out of Norway actually tell us that this might be causing a major problem in the obesity rates in America and abroad. What they've determined is that animals, when they eat genetically modified organisms, they become fatter and they stay fatter for longer periods of time. And we do think it would hold true for humans. There are some great farmers who are doing things right. White oak pastures, for example, they grass feed the cows and they pasture raise all their poultry. And when they're eating the proper foods, we're not feeding them GMO pellets or GMO corn and soy. So that's really what you want to look for. If you look over there, it says grass fed and that's what you want to put in your cart. There is a good solution in every single aisle. Some experts are going against the grain and looking at a staple of the American diet, wheat. I'm Isla, and I'm a wheat-free blogger. This is my blog, It's Gourmet Girl Cooks. It's filled with my different wheat-free creations. I made the decision to go wheat-free a year ago. I went wheat-free for a multitude of reasons. Um, I had just had a physical, and um, besides being overweight, uh, my blood work came back really bad. My triglycerides were sky high and I knew I had to do something. The doctor said, exercise, healthy whole grains, um, and my weight continued to go up, my triglycerides continued to go up, and I exercised like a fiend, and still, I didn't get any improvement. She wanted to put me on medication, and I gave this a last ditch attempt to try to do it with diet. We've been told that we should cut our fat eat more healthy whole grains. Not only is that ineffective advice, it's the worst possible advice you can give a population. I was trying to help people undo heart disease, trying to stop the things that cause heart disease or even reverse it. And one of the quick lessons you learn is someone cannot be diabetic or pre-diabetic and have control over heart disease. So I asked people to remove the highest glycemic index food of all that dominates diet, and that is wheat. And that's when I started to see not just reductions in blood sugar, but dramatic transformations in health. It has worked tremendously for me. I have lost 66 pounds in a year. My triglycerides have dropped from 546 to 115 in about seven months. I have tremendous energy. I mean, I've got energy. I have no more body aches. I'm not stiff in the mornings when I get up. Um, I just, I feel like I'm 30 again. We've lost the five million family farms, a place where there's a family, three pigs, four cows, six chickens, and 20 acres of tomatoes and lettuce. Now we have vast tracts, vertically integrated, agribusiness dominated agriculture, growing three crops. And that's what we've come to regard as food now. So we go to the store, mother goes to the store, she buys grains. And that's what we've been told to do, that's what people have been doing. Look at the result. We now have the worst epidemic of weight gain, obesity, and diabetes, and other health conditions that the world has ever witnessed. This is the fault of grains. We fell into a trap of flawed logic. We've seen the studies that if we replace something unhealthy, white and rich flour products, with something less unhealthy, whole grains, and there's an apparent health benefit. There's no question that there is a health benefit. There's less diabetes, less weight gain, less heart disease, less colon cancer, no question. 
The conclusion using the flawed logic of nutrition is that, that a whole bunch of the less bad thing must be good. That's like to me saying, if unfiltered cigarettes are bad for you, and filtered cigarettes are less bad for you, by the logic of nutrition, you should smoke filtered cigarettes. Flawed logic. The next question would be, what if we removed grains entirely, in this case, wheat? Wheat today is not the wheat of 1950, 1960, not the wheat that mom had or grandma had. It is not the four and a half foot tall traditional notion of wheat we all remember. Modern wheat is an 18, 24 inch high yield, semi dwarf creation of genetics research. All those changes in outward characteristics are accompanied by dramatic changes in the genetics and the biochemistry of the plant as well. So wheat is many things. It's 10,000 different proteins. Among the most important proteins to be aware of is the gliadin protein. So gliadin is a component of gluten. So the changes introduced in the modern wheat change the structure of the gliadin protein by several amino acids. So the gliadin of, 2000, of the 21st century has mind effects. It's a mind active drug. It has opiate effects like heroin or morphine, except it doesn't cause pain relief nor euphoria. It only causes mind effects such as triggering of behavioral outbursts and difficulty with attention span and learning in kids with ADHD and autistic spectrum disorder. And thus everyday people with none of those problems, it only triggers appetite, such that the average person who consumes more healthy whole grains is triggered to consume 400 more calories per day, 365 days per year. Those calories that you're prompted to consume are not going to be from salmon or pork chops, they're from junk food. I can honestly say personally, I have not counted one calorie since I started eating wheat-free. The biggest gift for me is I don't have the appetite swings. I don't have that hunger, that gnawing. I eat a normal portion and I'm done. I can walk away from food. I'm not craving. It's just, it's made a tremendous difference. And to me, for me personally, that's the biggest gift. There's an initial skepticism on the part of many people who do this, because after all, we've been told, eat more healthy whole grains. So one of the uh, criticisms offered is that there's no science here. And I can tell you that there's a, a lot of science here. It just hasn't been collected together. And so that's all I've done. So what happens when someone go, decides to go wheat free? Well, first of all, 40% of people experience an opiate withdrawal syndrome. So about 40% of people will experience fatigue, nausea, headache, and depression. It lasts about five days. Once you're beyond that, you feel wonderful. You have a surge of energy, sleep is deeper, acid reflux, bowel urgency of irritable bowel syndrome disappears in the majority of people. People with joint pain, particularly in the fingers and wrists, gone within three to five days. When you see these kinds of stories unfolding every day, many times a day, you realize this is not just mass hysteria, this is not just some wild coincidence. These are real effects that were never attributed to wheat because no one ever thought to look there. I hope to inspire people with my blog and with this show. Um, I have posted almost every meal that I have made since I've started this journey. And it's a pictorial diary of my experience over the last year. And I wanna show people there are appropriate and satisfying substitutions you can make without wheat. It hasn't stopped me from enjoying the foods that I like. But I do understand it is more expensive, but I'd rather pay for better food now than lots of prescription drugs later. What's the prescription for a healthy bee population? Honeybees are rapidly declining, which will affect all of us. Without bees, you have no food. One third of what we eat is on our plates because of honeybees, because of their pollination, because of what they're doing in the fields for us. When you walk into the grocery store and you turn into that produce aisle, basically almost everything that's there, um, your uh, watermelons and cantaloupes, um, your you know nectarines and your cherries. I mean, it just the, the list goes on and on. If you love to eat, period, <laughs> you need to care about honeybees. So colony collapse disorder is when literally the beehive collapses. You come back to the hive and there are no bees there. So what is this mysterious thing? 
In 2005 and especially in 2006, we started to hear about bee decline or colony collapse disorder. And I saw an advertisement for a grub control product that contained imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid, a synthetic nicotine. It's a class of insecticides. It primarily is used as a systemic. So they will treat a seed, that seed will grow, and that, that insecticide will grow into the plant. So then when the bug comes by and eats, gnaws on the plant, it, it ingests this insecticide and dies. And you'll, you'll literally will see bees upside down dead on the ground, which, which we never ever used to see. Well, we now know that a lot of beekeepers are losing up to 70% of their hives from colony collapse disorder. And nationally, beekeepers are losing 30 to 40%. This is nationally 30 to 40% of their bees since 2006, when these synthetic nicotines really came into widespread use in the United States. And I wrote an article at that point that said, is are these products killing the bees? And of course, the chemical company said, no, absolutely not. Well, we now have evidence that shows that these synthetic nicotines are killing the bees. And in fact, Europe and many other places around the globe have banned these products. I look at honeybees as kind of the canary in the cave. There are environmental indicators. Every time that bee or those bees leave the hive, they are exposed to all sorts of uh, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, uh, airborne pollutants, all sorts of different toxins. And they may not be exposed to them to such a degree they're killing them outright in the field, but they're exposed a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. They bring that back to the colony and sublethally you know, on a small, minute scale, it builds up and then over time kills the bees. Since it's a new class of insecticides, um, a lot of people are concerned that they have not been properly tested in the field. It's one thing to do testing in the lab, okay? You take a bee, you expose it to a chemical, the bee dies or doesn't die. Now, okay, do we, do we approve that pesticide? Because, well, it didn't kill the bee right out. It might have killed it a couple days down the road. But what's going on in the field? Europe has put a moratorium on these products. We keep approving new ones. We might get rid of one, but then we replace it with another one that can ultimately be even worse. If a product doesn't cause cancer in humans, our EPA is inclined to approve that product. They don't look at all the other collateral damage that a product might cause. And in fact, in Europe and elsewhere in the world, the benefit of the doubt doesn't go to the product. Folks have to prove that it's safe prior to being sold. Here in the United States, the benefit of the doubt always goes to the product first because there's so much money to be made from the manufacturer of these products. You put it out there, it's out in the market for 10 years, 20 years. In the case of diazinon, which went away in 2004, it was literally around for 50 years until they said, you know what, this stuff's really causing a lot of problems to human, to human health. So they took it off, 50 years of exposure before they took it away. That's a backward way of looking at this problem. The public can do actually a lot of good. Um, in their homes, in their gardens, they can grow uh, plants that are bee friendly, pollinator friendly. So they, they can provide food and shelter for pollinators. They can also eliminate or reduce the amount of pesticides that they're using. But if pesticides have to be used, then what we recommend is that you spray in the evening hours. That way you are not contaminating the area while pollinators are active. You never uh, spray the bloom, which is you know, where the pollinators are gonna have the majority of their activity, and use pesticides that break down rapidly. So that if you spray in the evening, by the next day, that pesticide is gone, is no longer toxic. People definitely need to be more educated about where their food comes from, how is it produced. I mean, it's just like I tell people, for instance, honey. I would recommend that you don't buy it from a big chain store. You go to that farmer's market or to the health food store and buy local honey because it's, it's not been shipped all over the United States. Plus, a lot of stuff that's brought into the United States from various countries, um, they, they cut it. So you may only be getting 20, 30% honey and the rest is high fructose corn syrup because it's cheaper. I'm an optimist and I think, um, I do believe 
that we are moving in the right direction. I think there has been a lot more attention to what we're doing to our environment, um, but I think we need to accelerate it a bit more, um, especially when it comes to honeybees because they're the canary in the cave. They're telling us, hey folks, we're doing something here um, and we need to figure out what we're doing before it's too late. I think change is going to occur when, when people, when the public demands something better. A handful of an environmentalist is not going to make the difference. It's going to be when the public says, I'm not buying that. I think we have to understand, though, we can't shop our way into a sustainable future. We have power as consumers, and that's great, and we should take that step, but we have to go beyond that. We have to participate in our democracy. I think if you're frustrated, you're angry, you need to write letters to the editor, you need to write letters to your congressman. We eat the earth, so we should care about it, care where it comes from and how it's made, and care what's behind that and how it impacts the world around us and future generations.